I'm going to talk to you about the pan genome project. And I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that's you know already out there. And if you've seen the papers, it'll be revision. And then I'm going to talk sort of in the latter half of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the new things that we're doing, what's coming next, and, and how close we are. Um, yeah, and the focus and what I'm going to end with is really this thesis that actually what we're doing paradoxically with the Pan Genome Project is just is ultimately building a better and better prior on what it on what human variation is that then us, allows us to zero in on individual personal genomes, um, how we can represent individuals better uh, when we do genomics. Okay, so all right, so for people who haven't been paying attention, um, GRCH38 is the current you know cornerstone, if you will, of human genomics, right? Um, we use it like a proxy to a universal coordinate system, right? It's this singular genome assembly that we use in the human space and that we refer to everything basically with respect to it, right? Um, so think gene annotations, think of all the functional data that we have, think of all the variants that we have. We talk about everything through the lens of that one reference. And of course, it dates back, you know, originally back uh, so 30 years and, and uh, in terms of the actual initial assembly, 20 years, uh, and took you know an act of Congress to create. Um, and it has actually been refined um, substantially since that initial draft. Um, and initially it was built just to represent the euchromatic portions of the genome, right? And it's actually, you know, by design, a mosaic of individuals. So essentially, if you think of the primary path of the assembly, we have essentially a mosaic representation of a, a group of, of individuals. Um, and it is it is still incomplete, right? There are still areas um, that are wrong or that are gaps or that are simulated uh, in that in that reference sequence. So uh, a couple of years back, um, time flies, right? Uh, my colleague Karen Meager and Adam Philippi and a whole huge group of people um, got together and created this total tour de force, the release of the of an initial, Telomere to telomere, I'll keep using this, this acronym T to T, telomere to telomere uh, genome assembly um, for a single haploid uh, human cell line, the CHM13 cell line. Um, and they released it and it adds about 200 uh, million bases of DNA to our, our view of, of, of human genomics that were previously unresolved uh, in, in that GSCH38 uh, assembly, right? With, you know, and we say it's complete, of course, there's a couple of little asterisks there around the RDNA, arrays on the acrocentric chromosome short arms. But aside from that, it really truly is an, an, a phenomenal individual singular reference. But of course, you know, yes, adding in that predominantly heterochromatin to our view of the reference is extremely important. Um, I don't want to undersell that in any way. Um, it's also true that any single reference cannot represent, but by definition, uh, the diversity of varying sequence that exists in the population. So um, we've known for a long time that there are more than 100 megabases of common polymorphic euchromatic sequence uh, missing from any individual reference, right? That we know is polymorphic in the population, right? And as a result, those are, those are the really interesting sequences in some sense, because they're the stuff that actually varies um, considerably between individuals. And as a result, we've been missing that sequence. We've not been studying it because we've done everything through the lens of a singular reference, and it creates a kind of observational bias. Um, I refer to it as a, a reference bias, in which we've been kind of, you know, it's like the lamp the lamppost effect, right? We've been looking at the things we can see and ignoring the things that are that are in the darkness around it. The Pan Genome Project really came out of a call that NHGRI had uh, now going back six or seven years, where a small group of us uh, got together um, and sort of lobbied NHGRI to, 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 to rethink um, its direction and to start contemplate uh, contemplating creating you know not just one reference genome but a whole cohort a whole population of reference genomes that could be broadly shared right and this came because we knew uh, so we knew that there was this sort of revolution brewing in genome assembly that meant that this could be kind of uh, you know contemplated at a reasonable cost um, which was certainly not true if we'd started any earlier than than, than we did and so um, the project I'm going to talk to you uh, talk about mostly today, um, this human pan genome project is this project to create um, of the order of 350 diverse uh, human genome assemblies, ultimately completely. So every single one of those genome assemblies, which uh, as Dustin was saying earlier, are diploid because, you know, CHM13 is the exception, right? Humans are diploid, right? Um, we will have telomere to telomere complete assemblies uh, of those individuals. And then of course, because 
350 references is actually on their own not very useful because you know they're all very very similar to each other and what do you do with that right um we actually need to integrate that information together and ultimately align that data together to create a map of genome variation um and then from there of course create tooling and so forth and a new ecosystem of tools that can actually take advantage of that information so that we are not limited uh by the by the lens of of, of a singular reference um, so, okay, sorry, this slide's a little out of date now because it's, it's been a year, um, but we are, you know, we have now released the draft of the human pan genome. Um, so stepping back, the project, essentially, we have three phases of the project. We've released the draft. We're now working on what we're calling the intermediate release, which will be a sort of very uh, um, a vast improvement, roughly five times more genomes, a vast improvement over the current project, but not the final release. Uh, and then in two years' time, we're aiming for to achieve the stable release, which is the the reference that we want to kind of persist indefinitely for the for the community. So today, I'm mostly going to talk about the draft. Um, occasionally, I'll look ahead to this intermediate release that we're we'll make this summer and, and make available to people. Um, Forty seven phased diploid assemblies. Um, that's you know roughly a seventh of the size of the final cohort. Um, it includes uh, genome alignments that we we built. I'll talk more about that. Um, and of course, uh, in creating the draft, we you know we started to create tooling um, and applications that could actually take advantage of this information um, to demonstrate concrete benefits. Because if we can't, you know, what are we doing if we can't actually demonstrate that this helps um, ultimately uh, in terms of uh, of, of genomic analysis? So um, for that draft, and this is also true for, for the intermediate and the stable release, we have largely drawn from the 1,000 Genomes. So 1,000 Genomes project, um, going back to 2011, um, was a fantastic project that essentially sampled uh, genetic diversity across uh, the globe. It is not completely comprehensive. There are definitely gaps in 1,000 Genomes. But as a starting point, uh, and what is critical to our project, they consented these samples for open data sharing. So we could go back, generate new materials from these individuals, and then share that information uh, publicly, which obviously is a high bar in terms of consent. Um, and the way that we did this, there's a, I could, you know, there's a whole talk here about the way in which you want to select samples for the pan genome. All I'm going to say, glibly say, is that what we attempted to do with the draft and what we're attempting to do as we move forward is essentially maximize um, our coverage of genetic diversity. There are a few different ways of trying to define that. Um, but in the initial draft, what we did was essentially, you know, if you take the sort of first few principal components um, of human diversity and you map that out, we attempted, we used an algorithm that es essentially attempts to cover as much of that diversity um, as, as you can, sort of cover the space uh, as much as you can. We also prioritized lines that have relatively low passage um, to minimize the number of acquired uh, errors. Um, and you know we looked at we looked at various other uh, metrics. So having selected our 47 samples, um, we this okay, again goes back to the sort of like the revolution that's been taking place in genome assembly over the last uh, five, six years. Um, we really uh, pushed at the initial phase of the project on sort of improving pipelines for de novo assembly. So um, I've, I've, I've put down a few papers here. In fact, this is this slide's a little bit out of date at this point in terms of papers I should reference. But um, we you know, leveraging, as Dustin was talking about, leveraging new sequencing technologies, um, we devised, as I'll talk about, a number of new pipelines for genome assembly. I think one of the critical things that was underappreciated up to that point was that actually it is was it is now no longer acceptable to create um, a non-haplotype resolved assembly in which the haplotypes are smushed together, right? That's been the tradition um, for a very, very long time. But actually now in de novo assembly, it is essential if we want to get the genome right that we resolve the different haplotypes because they are structurally different and they cannot be mushed together without creating um, without creating assembly errors, essentially, right? Um, we also, of course, because we want to do this at scale, um, the group as a whole have worked intensely on new algorithms um, that make this process vastly more efficient. And again, there are whole talks to be given about that, the, the improvements in that assembly. But I will say that, you know, when we started out um, and we were looking at using the canoe assembler, you know, we were looking at tens of thousands of CPU hours, uh, you know, distributed across clusters 
to generate each individual assembly. And now we have it down to things that can run on a single node in a few hours to generate uh, the genome assemblies that we use. Um, for the pipeline that we used in the initial draft, we held a bake-off. You can see the details were published in this, this nice paper. Um, we held this bake-off where we got a sort of best of breed of different assembly methods. And after, you know, long story short, we ended up picking um, at the time Trio HiFiism, which essentially uses those PacBio HiFi reads plus Illumina data from the parents, which is used for phasing information to derive um, to derive the assembly. So there's a number of other things we did in terms of contamination and so forth, right? Um, but we defined that pipeline and we kind of containerized that pipeline, made it reproducible, uh, deposited it in DocStore, of course, um, and we applied it using the uh, NHGRI's Anvil platform. Um, we applied it to all of our samples and actually lots of other people now have taken that pipeline and have been applying it themselves. Um, essentially reproducing um, what we did, which is great. Um, I won't, I won't uh, kind of go into this other than this is becoming a little historical at this point. Um, it's worth saying that the contiguity uh, of the assemblies was you know, very, very good, um, but not yet at this level of complete telomere to telomere chromosomes. So the, this is an NGX plot, which is essentially a measure of, of contiguity. This midline represents the N50 point. Uh, CHM13 is plotted here to show you kind of the theoretical maximum for a human genome and GRCH, the contigs of GRCH38 are shown here as this black line and all of the purple lines are essentially one of our assemblies. And you can see that the assemblies that we produced um, had contiguities in the tens of megabases. I think the average was about 40 uh, megabases, which means that half of the assembly uh, assemble bases were in contigs that were at least 40 million bases in length um, or longer. Um, base accuracy, we, we measured this many different ways, but now with you know, contemporary de novo assembly, we have base accuracies in roughly the one error per 200,000-ish bases, um, which, is, which is also you know, fantastically good. Um, we have, since this time, again, I, I, with the intermediate release, we now have newer methods for, for, the, uh, method for, for polishing the assemblies. And I think in this next round of the assemblies, um, we'll actually be able to push that to closer to um, one in a million to one in, for some, for some certain regions of the genome, one in 10 million um, errors. So we can get that, that, that residual base error rate down to something that's very, very, very low um, to the point that, that our sequences are becoming close to perfect. Um, also very gratifying um, when we look at this is just the actual fraction of the genome that has been assembled. And here I'm just showing you the sizes of the haplotype resolved portions of each assembly. And you can see that the chromosomes that contain an X chromosome, so the haplotypes that contain an X chromosome, are, are all about three and a bit gigabases and change. And then those that contain a Y chromosome, obviously Y is considerably shorter than X, uh, those are around 2.9 and a bit uh, gigabases, right? Basically recapitulating what we know in terms of the sex difference, um, in terms of what we'd expect the haploid assembly length. And again, at this point, this went, you know, historically, uh, when we first saw this, it was kind of like a, an aha moment because up to that point, we were just never at the point where our assemblies would actually really reasonably show that they were getting close to a complete assembly. And once we got this and we could see this, and we could compare to CHM13, which we knew was right, um, we really were pretty convinced that we were assembling almost all uh, of the assemblable sequence of a, of a complete genome uh, for each of these samples. We, um, as Dustin mentioned, we developed as part of the project a variety of different uh, ways to try and evaluate the assemblies. And one of my favorite ways to do this is to say, well, if you think of an assembly as a kind of a hypothesis for, you know, because it's a guess, right, um, for, for what the underlying genome is, then one way to measure its accuracy is to say, well, how, you know, how you know, what is the likelihood of that assembly given the reads, right? Now, of course, turning that into a full probability model is a little challenging, but one way we can approximate that essentially is to take our diploid assembly and then map our reads uh, using a program like Minimap or WinnowMap, map our long reads back onto uh, that assembly, and then essentially look at the coverage distribution across that assembly. And good regions of the genome, we, you know, we should see an expected you know, given the binomial expectation, we should see a roughly haploid uh, number of reads aligning. And when we have more reads than we would expect by chance, or fewer uh, reads than we would expect by chance, we can infer that there's either been some sort of collapse where there are actually more copies of the sequence than there should be, uh, sorry, where there are fewer copies of the sequence than there should be in the actual genome, 
or when there are more copies uh, with a false duplication. So we applied this uh, these methods uh, to our genome um, and uh, to our genomes. And the sort of long story short is that about 99% or slightly more than 99% of the bases of our assemblies were you know, predicted according to Flagger to be structurally correct. Um, we we did we also sort of looked at this a bunch of different ways, but I think the high bit here is that yeah, roughly ninety nine percent of our assemblies um, are supported robustly by read alignments, with a bit less than one percent. So this plot is a little misleading because there's a discontinuity here. So this green, which corresponds to haploid, this is the sequence that we believe to be correct, right? Is almost all of these plots. We just have to cut it off because it wouldn't be very impressive. We wouldn't be able to see any of the detail otherwise. Um, and then the errors are varying from, you know, the very low, a few, you know, 10, 10 or so megabases per, per um, haploid uh, assembly through to the few tens of megabases. Um, and I can get into the ones with higher error errors. We can explain what's going on there. But um, yeah, so it, in general, we can say that our assemblies were just, you know, very, very reliable uh, versus anything that people had to sort of achieve uh, prior to this point. We looked at, uh, the assemblies also from a gene point of view, and actually working with the ensemble group, we created the prototype of a sort of new annotation pipeline. Because obviously, so you know, stepping back, if you're ensemble, you've been in the business for 20 years of annotating individual reference genomes, singular, right? And you, what you haven't been doing is trying to annotate, you know, populations of genomes from one from from one species, right? And there are certainly computational challenges with that because you've suddenly got, you know, lots and lots more data to potentially annotate. So the ensemble folks worked on a mapping-based annotation pipeline um, that essentially takes, in this case, gen code because we're working in human, so taking the gen code human annotation and mapping all of that information uh, back onto each of these assemblies and then using a bunch of relatively stringent filters to attempt to predict um, orthologs. And um, we can do that, you know, uh, we can do that pretty accurately. So, uh, you know, again, the sort of high level here is that for protein coding genes, a little bit more than 99% of protein coding genes can be annotated uh, from gen code, can be lifted over and annotated on each of our assemblies. The fraction is a little lower for the non-coding portion of the genome. But I can tell you that the challenge here is not just an assembly challenge, did we get the assembly right, but actually for that missing, you know, that missing 1% or 1.5% 1 .1 is actually all about gene family variation. Because of course, uh, we do you know, have gene family get, you know, expansions and contractions in our genomes, and that does make it quite challenging to map correct orthologs in some cases. So some of this is actually evolution of the annotation pipeline that explains the sort of delta, why we're not quite at 100% yet. Um, and just for a comparison, just so you can see the assembly effect, effect here, we, this is the orange point here actually shows you um, what happened when we applied the pipeline to CHM13, which we believe to be you know, pretty close to perfect. So certainly not perfect, but still very, very, very good. Um, one of the interesting things about these assemblies that I think uh, is, um, has been underappreciated, but allowed us, you know, I, I think people have known about it, but we haven't really been able to illustrate it very well, um, is that human beings are actually incredibly copy number polymorphic at the gene level. Of course, we all know that, you know, we have large uh, CNVs in our genome, um, but it wasn't until I sort of saw this that I, I was kind of like, it really hit home just how copy number variable um, individual human genomes are in terms of their gene content. So on average, I think, um, Per sample, we predict about 38 gene copy number gains uh, per genome per, uh, uh, yeah, uh, relative to GRCH38. I think in total, about 7%, it was between 6 and 7% of all protein coding genes in the human, human genome are copy number variable in one of just our 47 samples, which is kind of mind blowing, that level of structural variation within the transcriptome. And this plot here that I'm showing you um, just sort of illustrates uh, sort of two things. So ba basically, first off, uh, the number of, so these are uh, the blue bars here, essentially for these particular genes that we have on the x-axis, show the uh, copy numbers that we observed in our haplotypes for our, our 90 samples. And you can see these are all relative, these are all gains. So we have a one here, that's one extra copy with respect to GRCH38. And there are some uh, genes where GRCH38 is a sort of the minor allele. So GPRINT2, right, 
almost everybody has at least one extra copy of GPRINT2 versus GRCH38, right? It is really insufficient to study GPRINT2 through GRCH38 because it does not represent the population copy number. And then of course there are other genes, like for example, this ZNF595, this zinc finger, where there's huge variation in the number of copies uh, in, the, in the population, right? And so these gray bars here just to illustrate the number of our individuals, sorry, the number of individual haplotypes that have additional copies relative to GRCH38, the number of our haplotypes that are at least um, gains. Um, so I think that this is this is something that's you know hugely important uh, for us to kind of hit home and uh, and and further study as we uh, move forward. Of course, people have known about copy number variation for a long time since you know many studies in short reads, but now I think what this does is allow us to view this information in a haplotype resolved uh, manner. Uh, and just to show you what I mean by haplotype resolved, so here is that GPRIN2 locus. Now here, um, on, uh, let me get this right, yeah, so on the um, y-axis here, we've got GRCH38. GRCH38 has this uh, one copy of GPRIN2, and then this is another haplotype, and you can see our ensemble pipeline has annotated uh, four copies, right? But when you look at that dot plot, so, you know, you can see that just this is really a hall of mirrors in terms of the structural variation and inversion haplotypes and so forth. And it's only once you can kind of create these sequence resolved uh, assemblies, you can really start to appreciate the complexity of these kinds of loci. One other, I think, really nice biological result that came out of the, the initial draft um, is something that helps to explain a long held observation in humans. So it's known, it's been known for a very long time that the most common um, interchromosomal uh, rearrangement that takes place in human carrier types are so-called Robertsonian translocations, where you get uh, essentially uh, a change in, in the carrier type of an acrocentric chromosome. So um, we were initially, when we were looking at the assemblies that we created for the pan genome, um, we were looking for, for errors, essentially, things where we, had, where we had made a mistake in our assemblies, Right? And we were looking for these interchromosomal uh, joins where we'd accidentally fused together two chromosome arms you know, computationally uh, from the data. And when we looked, we did find one uh, error in our assembly, um, which we fixed, um, that was apparent and it was in genuinely an assembly error. But then we found about 300 um, apparent fusions between the acrocentric short arm of chromosomes. So, you know, the acrocentric chromosomes, chromosomes, uh, always get this wrong, uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, 21, and 22, right? They, they're they acrocentric, they have these, uh, you know, the short arm and a long arm, and those short arms, right, we were seeing lots and lots of fusion events where the assembler was saying, no, 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 this is fused to this other apparently homologous sequence when, you know, when we consider with respect to say, say the carrier type of CHM13. And that's what this, this plot showing here was created by Heng. Um, and so then Eric's team, Eric Garrison's team, um, former postdoc in my lab now, independent. Uh, um, um, he His lab basically drilled down on this and figured out that what's actually going on is that, um, you know, on the acrocentric chromosome short arms, there is, there is a region, there are regions um, which appear to be highly similar to each other, so similar to each other that they could only maintain that similarity if they were in some senses recombining over time. And so what we think is happening is that there is some mechanism that presumably to do with the construction of the nucleolus, because this is the, you know, the way ribosome formation, all that stuff, right? Um, there's something that maintains homology between those chromosome, chromosome short arms and at some rate, recombines between these different uh, chromosomes at some rate so that we are seeing swapping of the short arms between uh, between the different uh, uh, chromosomes on a regular basis. And again, speculating, this may be what's going on in Robertsonian translocation where you get an aberrant uh, translocation of this form that then creates essentially a fusion of two uh, acrocentrics together instead of having just a recombination. So anyway, a really, really fascinating and, and a really nice paper that came along was published back to back with the pan genome. You can go and see the details on, but I think it's a it's a really nice explanation where we can see genome function that we couldn't see before until we assembled these incredibly difficult portions of the genome that then leads to a kind of uh, aha moment about you know genome rearrangement. Um, again, also just to illustrate, I, I don't want to go too long here, but uh, just to illustrate, um, you know, 
the dark matter of the genome being revealed by these genome assemblies. It's been known for a long time that the most structurally uh, variable alleles in the human genome are in heterochromatin, right? Um, and so, for example, human centromeres are, you know, uh, crazy uh, diverse in terms of their the size of the sequence. So here is just, uh, you know, um, some staining showing you these are, you know, the same chromosome, but with different, very, very different alleles at their centromere. And so we could actually pick out of our assemblies fully assembled uh, centromeric arrays that we then validated using Flagger and NoopFreak and other tools, right? And, and then for the first time, kind of catalog that variation. Um, so this is actually credit to Mobin in my lab, um, but others have also been, been showing this, uh, Glennis Logston and so forth in Evan Eichler's lab, showing that actually, um, you know, between human individuals, between alleles, there is a huge diversity uh, in terms of centromeric content. You know, so for example, this is uh, this is human centromere two, and you can see that some individuals in our cohort have a, a, a centromeric uh, assembly of roughly 2.7 megabases, and other individuals have a sequence that's well under a megabase, right? And this is because the centromere generally doesn't seem to re recombine. It is resistant to recombination. So we have essentially these islands of sequence that evolve relatively independently, somewhat like a Y chromosome, um, that evolve relatively independently and therefore, you know, through a get through a process of sort of shuffling and constant uh, turnover, right, have 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 like di have diverged very, very considerably in, in the genome. And that's just, you know, uh, again, mind blowing to me in terms of uh, how complex these sequences are and, and how much we have to learn about these regions of the genome that have hitherto been basically invisible to us at the sequence level. Okay, so um, sort of switching gears from talking about the assemblies and what they can tell us to now, you know, what we are going to do with the pangenome and how it's going to impact you know, our lives. And I'll, I'll sort of run through this relatively quickly. You know, at a cartoon level, you know, the project that we have is take individuals, construct these haplotype phased assemblies, right? And then, you know, the next step is, okay, integrate them together. And um, some of us for a long time have been advocating that, you know, the, the right way to think about this is, you know, the, the, the pan genome is essentially a trinity of three A's, as I like to tell people. There's assemblies, and then there's alignments of those assemblies. And those alignments can be represented in, in a general form. So think of a, 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 a multiple sequence alignment in which you admit things like inversions and copy number changes and so forth, right? A general structure to represent a multiple sequence alignment a very convenient structure that we know a lot about uh, from a from a computer science point of view, from a math point of view, is is a graph. And so, genome graphs um, are a means, just a means to represent uh, a general multiple sequence alignment. The last A of that trinity, of course, is annotation. So, if you will, assembly, alignment, and annotation. But focusing on this alignment step, you know, our task was to take all of these assemblies and then build genome alignments of those uh, assemblies that essentially merge together where the sequences are the same and allow them to diverge where they're different, right? And so of course now that structure, that alignment is no longer just linear sequences, but actually you know, something that bifurcates and therefore has, has more complex structure. But it's really important to emphasize that when we build these, uh, the, these alignments, we always have a, sort, a, way, a means to, sort, to, to go back to the, to the underlying haplotypes because those haplotypes are embedded as paths that flow through these graphs. Um, I think I'm going to skip this for a second. So I, I'm, I, I'm going to argue, if, if you're interested, ask me later. But I want to emphasize that there's a very good reason for why you want a pangenome alignment rather than just picking a specific reference that you might choose, because the latter idea doesn't work. Anyway, I'll skip over that for now. So with genome alignments, um, we use genome graphs. Um, these are just a generalized form of a sequence graph. Uh, in which essentially the nodes represent sequences. And what's really critical to understand is that when we think about a genome graph, it's not just the graph, it's the graph plus the paths that flow through it, the haplotypes that flow through it. And we can always relate back to those haplotypes because those are the truly, you know, the biological sequences. The alignment is just a way of trying to get at how they are related to each other. Um, so one thing that's very important, again, I'll skip over this very briefly, is to say that we've worked a lot on data compression, because once you see one human genome, the next genome is just a delta from it and so forth. And, you know, there are diminishing returns in terms of that added variation. And so the upshot of this is that um, this is work from Yoni Siren, who's a research scientist in the lab. Um, we now have efficient means to ship 
and transport around uh, you know some approaching 300 billion bases of, of of DNA in a file that's less than three gigabytes of 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 of, uh, of disk space. Um, and this is because we can essentially take advantage of data compression um, when we are you know expressing the differences between genomes. It's um, it's a really nice thing. We also in the project spent a lot of time um, essentially playing around with different ways to align these uh, assemblies together to figure out the right way to build these genome alignments, how to build these genome graphs. Um, there really isn't, again, time to talk about all the details here, but I will say that there are essentially three pipelines right now. So one is Minigraph, which is Heng's, uh, uh, Heng Lee's tool. It's really focused on just displaying structural variation. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't admit small variants. Um, and it's very, very useful because it's very, very fast. It's a great way of producing a draft map of structural variation. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan. And then because we wanted something that integrated all of the information together, we actually took Minigraph and in my group sort of uh, bolted it onto Cactus, our, our between species genome aligner. Um, and we've created this Minigraph Cactus pipeline, which is one of the pipelines, one of the two core pipelines now that we use for building these, these pan-genome alignments. And this essentially takes the initial mini-graph and refines it to add in all the base level information. Um, one thing I should say here, and I'll get to this at the end, is that right now that mostly omits by, by exclusion, we remove it, um, the very, very complex variation that occurs in satellites, just because our alignment algorithms don't really handle that sequence very well. And then finally, um, from Eric's lab, there's this uh, PGGB, Pan Genome Graph Builder, um, which doesn't take, you know, unlike Minigraph and Minigraph Cactus, has no notion of a starting reference. It's a completely symmetric all-to-all -all process um, that is very ambitious and produces uh, quite complex graphs, but that has very has a lot of value for certain purposes. Um, I'll skip through this just to say that the graphs contain, you know, as you would expect, millions of variants, um, tens of thousands of structural variants of all types. Um, we did a lot of work to validate the variation that we see in the graphs, and the upshot is that the graphs are at least as consistent with known structural variants as any structural variant caller is with known libraries of structural variants. And I think if you are doubtful about why, you know, why do we need uh, a pangenome graph? Why can't, you know, you know are, are humans really that complex, right? I think that there are some, let's say about 600 loci in the genome where it is very apparent when you look at the graph structure that no, that, the, that a linear reference sequence is a very, very poor proxy to that, that sequence. So here I'm just showing you um, HLA-A. So this is obviously you know, part of the major histocompatibility complex. Um, and this is just showing you this locus that contains HLA-A and a bunch of paralogs of HLA-A, right? That are sort of um, uh, duplication copies of each other. Uh, and you can see this is the overall structure of the graph and it looks, you know, a very long way from being linear. And I think what's really interesting about this graph is that actually if we trace the individual haplotypes through it, so here, for example, here in set here is the same graph as I'm showing here over on the left. It's just what all it's doing is illustrating the path that GRCH38, the current reference uh, haplotype, flows through the graph. And you can see that this uh, path is, you know, mostly includes most of the sequence, but it completely skips this long arc but that contains this extra copy of HLA-A, HLA-Y. Now, it's been known for a long time before this, before the Pangenome project that HLA-Y existed, and it was known that it was pretty common in the population, but nobody could say exactly where it was, right? Because it doesn't really have a good place with respect to GRCH38. It's, it's not present in GRCH38. But you can see in our graph that, yep, it's here, and there are other haplotypes, for example, just consider this random haplotype, um, that do flow through, uh, this portion of the graph and that do indeed contain this extra copy of the gene. In fact, roughly a quarter of all human haplotypes do contain HLA-1. So again, just another illustration of why a single human haplotype is a very, very poor proxy to the richness of human variation in, uh, you know, most of the genome doesn't, isn't as interesting looking as this, but there are of the order of 600 of these, uh, of these loci where there is complex variation that's common uh, and it's, really nice to be able to see uh, how that kind of plays out once we start to build these uh, these pan genomes. Um, I'll skip over this just to say that, you know, the graphs we're building are complex. Um, they have order of uh, hundreds of millions of nodes and edges in them. Um, 
and represent you know uh, a lot of sequence. Um, what I I guess I wanted to illustrate from this is that when we built the initial pan genome, we did not include the heterochromatic sequence by and large. So what we did when whenever we accounted large volumes of heterochromatin, so these large repeat arrays, we essentially recognized that our alignment algorithms were not correctly representing that. And I, this I'm specifically talking about Minigraph cactus here, right, and Minigraph. Um, we recognize where those sequences just were not aligning. It's, um, it's a, like us saying, look, we know that there is some homology between these sequences, but we don't know how to express that reasonably. And our algorithms are not deriving reasonable alignments. So instead of including you know, junk alignments, we're just going to omit those sequences by literally clipping them out, right? And so that's what we did. So we ended up removing of the order of five gigabases of a uh, assembled sequence, five billion bases of assembled sequence um, from the Minigraph uh, cactus graphs, right? That are all of those very, very large centromeric alleles that are not homologous to, uh, or not obviously easily homologous uh, uh, to let's say the GRCH38 or CHM13 paths. Um, in contrast, the PGGB folks tried to include that sequence, but if you go look at their graphs, their graphs are very, very complex, I would say, um, to the point that it's not possible to map to them currently. Um, so yeah, so anyway, th that was where we left it with the draft. We sort of had a means to deal with the euchromatin, but not really the heterochromatin. So now in the last year or so, um, we set about devising algorithms that would allow us to kind of actually make reasonable alignments in these, you know, I, I've been referring to them as these last genomic wildernesses, right? These pl places where we really just don't know what is there, right, and how to compare it. So how do we do that? Well, okay, so here is a dot plot. Again, I'm, I'm very, watching the time here. Here is a dot plot that shows us uh, just, you know, the amount of repetitiveness between two actually structurally relatively similar in terms of length. Um, centromere arrays. This is, I think, for CENX, for the centromere uh, for chromosome X, right? Now, you can see that it's pretty difficult. You might be able to guess an approximate alignment by sort of staring, right? But it's pretty obvious that there's a huge amount of noise, right? A huge amount of self-similarity that's going to throw you off. But if instead of trying to optimize your alignment only to focus on similarity, instead you turn around and say, no, 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 I don't want to just optimize for similarity, which is what our alignment algorithms have been doing forever, right? Instead say, I want to optimize instead for uniqueness. What I want to capture is the maximum amount of unique sequence. So a sequence is unique if it only occurs exactly, a subsequence is unique if it occurs exactly once, right? If we try to find as much of our alignment to cover those quote unquote unique sequences, right? Um, then maybe we can derive a reasonable alignment. So here we've taken that exact same dot plot and now we're just coloring the, 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 you know, the, these little subsequences by how unique they are in the genome. And you can see that that kind of fades out most of this self-self similar alignment because it's not unique. It's, you know, we just see it over and over and over again, but it's not the same. So once we have that information, then it's actually possible for us to construct reasonably confident uh, alignments through these regions that um, I would bet a substantial money are, are correct. All right, and this, this is building, by the way, I should say, this is building on work from uh, Pavel Pevsner's group um, that we've sort of taken. And Jordan Isenger, who's a postdoc in my lab, has basically taken this and now um, generalized it using the, the framework of partial order, partial, partial order, partial order alignment um, to create multiple sequence alignment algorithms that can essentially build using uniqueness as criterion. And so now for the very first time, this is literally the very first bandage plot that we ever created to show uh, show what a centromere taking 38, I think 38 different centromeres um, looks like uh, in terms of uh, um, a genome graph. And yes, of course, it's very complex. No one is denying that it's very complex, um, but it is still massively compressing, massively better representing the alignment of the sequence uh, than we could do previously. So we're really optimistic that in this next round, in this intermediate round of the pan genome and beyond, we will be able to produce reasonable alignments of most of the heterochromes in most of the very large repeat arrays in our genome, and then use them in the in the way that we have been using other sequences, uh, and and actually start to find variants and catalog and map these things uh, between sequences, which I think is just incredible thing to be able to do. So that's something I'm super super excited about. And I think I'm running out of time, and so I want to be uh, I, I don't want to go longer than I should. 
So I just want to say that we've done a lot of work on a huge amount of work actually now on uh, on applications for the pan genome. Uh, Dustin mentioned this at the beginning. We've developed uh, mappers to the pan genome. Uh, we've worked with teams doing variant calling. And you know, long story short, variant calling using the pan genome is much better because we have a much better prior for what a human looks like. Um, and the best, both you know, commercial pipelines like the uh, Dragon pipeline, but also ours, the open source pipeline from the HPRC, just super outperform. Uh, uh, you know, previous best practices. I think we're now at a point where we're roughly 10 times fewer errors than the GATK best practice, which is which is huge. Um, another thing to say about applications is that obviously small variants are important from a genotyping point of view, but structural variants really are the sweet spot for the pan genome because they're what the pan genome reveals that we really didn't have previously. And we're now at a point, um, I'm just gonna skip through and say, we're now at a point um, where here we go, um, where our structural variant genotyping using, taking advantage of a number of different things, when we are trying, I'll be careful about the way I make this statement, um, for variants that we have already characterized in the pan genome, so they are present in the pan genome, we can genotype those variants as accurately or close, not quite, but close to as accurately with short reads as long read methods can um, discover them, right? Now, if you look at previous, this is a, this is a genome in a bottle benchmark. Previously, um, with, with long read, with short reads, you know, the accuracy, these, the, the highlighted yellow here is F1 score. The accuracy of short read structural variant callers is abysmal. And it's abysmal not because the, the methods are bad, it's because the problem is just inherently extremely difficult, right? It's extremely difficult to discover complex variations that are much larger than your read length using short reads. But now we can find these variants, now we know and resolve these variants using long reads, using the pan genome, we can go back to short read catalogs and actually accurately type them. This is what these points are showing over here, using the pan genome at, at levels that are close to performing, um, you know, at the level that we can with the best long read methods. Not quite, but not very far away. And we think there are still, you know, there's a bunch of more low hanging fruit so we think we'll be able to get to a point where we truly are able to genotype most of the you know, known structural variants at a very high level of accuracy, even using just traditional short reads. And I think that unlocks a, a lot of inter interesting projects. We can go back to biobanks and so forth and start uh, collating for the first time truly accurate short read um, structural variant calls um, using using the pan genome. And I think that that, is, that will be one of the biggest uh, biggest gains from the pan genome project. Um, so just to summarize, because again, I'm, I know I'm running out of time here. The pan genome that we've constructed um, so far adds about 120 megabases of unique uh, euchromatic sequence to the human reference. In total, I didn't say this, but in total, I think across just those 47 individuals, we've got 280 billion bases of haplotype resolved assembly. That's more than 1,500 gene duplications, uh, more than 20 million small variants, of the order of 70,000 structurally variant sites, many, many more alleles. And, you know, we know that adoption of the pan genome um, and all of the informatics that will come from it will take a bunch of time. Like I, I'm very conscious to say that I don't expect to see this being applied in the clinic, you know, next week or even next year. But we think that over time, as we're able to show just huge gains for downstream applications in using this information that we will be able to start to you know have a real impact on you know structural variant calling on small variant calling on you know many other tasks structural variant imputation and so forth right um, that i think are going to you know slowly you know push the needle and make genomics the genomics that we have less biased in the human space and more kind of comprehensive in terms of capturing all of all of the genetic richness that is present in our genomes. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the large number of people in my lab um, who've contributed here. I also want, particularly want to acknowledge Karen Meager, who is my kind of like partner at UCC on a lot of these projects um, and is helping, you know, Karen is really leading up a lot of the HPRC, uh, also folks at Google Health. And then I just want to thank um, everybody in the Pan Genome Project, because obviously it's much bigger than just a Santa Cruz project.